It's a famous simile in the texts. Where man is suffering from pain. And he gets tied up in anxiety and misery around the pain. And the Buddha says it's like being shot with an arrow and then shooting yourself with a second arrow. The physical pain is the first arrow, the mental pain is the second one. And it's the mental one that's important. It says the enlightened person, the awakened person, may still get shot with those first arrows, but doesn't shoot him or herself with the second. The second ones are important because they get shot right into the heart, into the mind. The first arrow can only go as far as the body. And it's the arrows that go into the mind, the ones that really hurt. They're the subject of the Four Noble Truths. That's the suffering in the Four Noble, First Noble Truth. The suffering that comes from craving and ignorance that gets shot into the heart. So our training is learning how not to shoot ourselves with that second arrow. Although it's always struck me that it's more than just one second arrow. There are lots of arrows that get shot. The question is, how do we learn not to do that? And the clue is given in another passage where the Buddha talks about a person who's gained very exalted states in meditation. I responds by saying, I am at peace. I am released. And the Buddha says it's the I am in there that's causing the problem. It shows that he, this person still has some connection, still has some clinging. Because after all, it is the craving combined with clinging that causes the suffering. And the I am that you build around things is an important type of clinging that comes under Especially comes under doctrine of self-clinging, your idea of who you are. And then you impose that on all kinds of experiences. You like to impose it on the ones where things are pleasurable. But once you set up the mold, the I am, and then you stick in a nice pleasurable feeling, that pleasurable feeling can change, replaced by an unpleasant feeling. So there you are, you've still got the sentence, I am this, but suddenly it's connected to something that's not pleasant. This is where the teaching on not self comes in. Learn how to view things without creating that sense of self. Because after all, it is something that we do. We do make the sense of self. And it has its functions. As the Buddha said, when you want to understand something, you have to see both its allure and its drawbacks. You don't just watch it arising and passing away. You want to understand, well, when it arises, why do you hold on to it? And the allure here is that the sense of self is useful in a lot of contexts. When you're eating food, you know which mouth to put it in. You know how to plan for the future. You know how to anticipate future dangers, that if you don't practice now, you're going to have trouble down the line. In that way, the sense of self is useful. But as with any activity, you've got to see when it's skillful and when it's not. And particularly if you find yourself shooting yourself with arrows that go into the heart, you've got a problem. As in the case of that meditator who was placed in the word, I am this, I am, around his meditative experiences, the Buddha compared him with someone else who simply says, there is this. When there's the perception of the infinitude of space, he doesn't equate himself with the infinitude of space, doesn't create a sense of pride around it, he simply says, there is this, infinite space, there is this, nothingness, there is this either perception or non-perception, or whatever the, the state may be.
that's one of the tools for getting around this habit of building a self all the time. This is a theme that comes in many places in the canon. The monk who's dwelling in emptiness. Looks at the perception of his mind. Might be the perception of the breath or whatever. And notices there are these disturbances here, but also there's this lack of disturbance compared with other perceptions. For instance, if you're sitting here with a perception of all the people sitting around you, then you start thinking about the stories of what this person said today and what you're going to have to do with that person tomorrow. There's a lot of disturbance just on that perception of people. But if you hold on to the perception simply of breath, the people disturbances go away. And you notice that. There's this level of disturbance with the breath because you still have to maintain it. You still have to work with the breath. So you notice there is this. That's for what's not here. You notice, okay, that's absent. When you're working with the frames of reference, you want to build up to the ability to simply notice there is the body. There are feelings. There are mind states. There are mental qualities. without building a lot of stories around them. And you can work in that direction. You're sitting here and it's warm tonight. And you could be thinking about the fact that it's a lot warmer tonight than it was last night. What does that mean for tomorrow? How am I going to get through the night? How am I going to get through tomorrow? May even go down to go down to the library, think up some project to find some air conditioning. It goes off in that direction. And then you can't do that. So you start suffering. You could simply say, however, there is this. And then look at what you've got here. It's typical when you see there is this, what is it? There are aggregates, there are sense media, and the properties of the body. Earth, water, wind, fire. Okay, we've got more fire tonight than normal. Is your body all fire? Well, no. It's got other elements as well. There's liquidity. There's the motion of the air, motion of the breath. And there's the solid parts. If things are feeling too warm. Is everything warm? No, there's still some water in there. It's still cool in some places in the body. But where are those cool sensations? Which part of the body feels cooler than the others? I'll focus on that. And you can stay with that sense of coolness. Notice. Can you spread it around? That's where you learn how to make use of what's there. There is this, there is warmth, but there's also the parts. There's also the area which is not warm. Or you can forget about the issue of hot and cold altogether and focus on the breath. How is the breath moving? Is the breath moving in a healthy way? Is it obstructed? Is it unobstructed? You can look at that. As long as you stay simply on the level of elements, you're not shooting yourself with those second arrows. You're simply, simply staying on the level of there is this. You're not creating stories around it. The more precisely you see what is there when you say there is this, you begin to see that you had taken a few details from the present and were stitching them together in a story that was making you suffer. And you can ask, well, why should I do that? you realize you've got the choice of what you're going to focus on. That's a lot of freedom right there. You, see, you sense the eye building up around it, planning for tomorrow, 
or thinking about what happened today. You can cut through it. There is the thought of I, but is it helpful now? No. If you're not carrying around the assumption that you are something, things are a lot lighter. Just stand the level up there as this and explore. Well, what is there? What is the this? How many thises are here right now? There are lots of thises. And you've got the choice what you're going to focus on. So the sense of self you have, learn how to use it appropriately. Realize that it's an optional storyline and it's an optional concept. That's helpful in some circumstances and harmful in a lot of other ones. And practice looking at the there is this. To see what's going on. To see what role your present intentions are playing in shaping what's going on. And storylines and assumptions and all the other things you tend to cling to. What do you have to let go of in order to stop that suffering? When you look at things on this level, it's simply arising and passing away without carrying the storylines around all the time. It's a lot easier to let go of the things that the storylines would require. If you don't have to identify something as me, then you don't have to worry about what's going to happen to me tomorrow. Or if the thought of me and I for tomorrow comes up, you realize that's optional. It's not built into the way things are. This is one of the reasons why we get the mind concentrated, because as the Buddha said, once the mind is concentrated, you can see the aggregates as they arise. You can see events at the sense spheres. You can analyze your sense of the body into the aggregates and properties. So when you simply look at things as they present themselves to your awareness here in the present moment, you get to see what's really there and what's not. And you see that what's really there is not nearly as oppressive as the story has made it out to be. If you take it just on this level, even when there's severe pain, it's a lot easier to take when you're taking it just what's right here, right now. You're not weighing it yourself down with thoughts of how long you've been in pain and how much longer you're going to be in pain. Or it's being caused by somebody else. Why is that person causing it? You simply look at, here's the pain. What can be done about it? Where should I focus my attention so I don't have to suffer? One thing you could do is watch the pain pass away, pass away, because from moment to moment it just keeps passing away. It's the difference between riding in a car facing forward and riding in a car facing backward. Facing forward, you seem to take on everything coming at you. And you become weighed down by everything that's coming in, coming in, coming in at you. But if you turn around and face away, face the back of the car as you're going, you just see things passing away, passing away, passing away. And the actual impact is the same. But your attitude has changed. You see things passing away, and you're not gathering them in. And John Lee gives the example of someone who's plowing on the field. Plowing a field. And there are those people who try to take the dirt as it falls off the plow and stick it in a bag. And of course they're going to get weighed down. But if you simply watch the dirt as it falls off, falls off, falls off, you're not carrying anything around with you. 
you don't get weighed down. You can complete the plowing. So that's the other thing to think about as you're watching. There is this. You want to say, this is passing away. You'd have to collect those things and get, or gather them up and store them anywhere. And that's in the way. That's the way you see that that first arrow is really not all that painful at all. 